Welcome to Drive the DAF. Clear, structured explanation of the daily DAF in 20 minutes. You can even follow in the car. We begin Mesechus Pesachim, DAF Memches, quite a ways into the DAF as we completed the last sugya in the top part of the DAF. And Memches has two Mishnais, therefore it's divided into three sugyas. It's really almost four sugyas. The first one is about what you do with uh, chala on Pesach, that's chala that was separated from your matzah, the mitzvah of chala to give to Kohanim. What you do with that on Pesach if it became metame? We've already seen a machokas tanoim about that, three opinions. We're trying to figure out possibly what that machokas is based on and link it to a machokas amarim, which we've been discussing about the concept of hoel. Then the Gemara will discuss what is the maximum size of dough you can make on Pesach at once. We get to our next Mishnah, which we'll discuss how many women can share one oven meaning uh, how much is the dough allowed to wait before it goes into the oven on Pesach. And then we'll talk about when, what signs indicate that a dough is becoming chametz. That's the topic of the last Mishnah. Okay, so first of all, as way way of introduction, we've been discussing what happens if somebody is making matzah on Pesach. He has to take off challah. That challah, if it's tamay, can be eaten. It's forbidden to eat. Therefore, it should have a problem to be baked. You shouldn't be allowed to bake it on Yom Tov. Um, because you're only allowed to bake something you can eat. For nefesh, this you cannot eat. Additionally, you can't give it to Kohanim to, because it's uh, it's tame, and you can't burn it or destroy it because it's hectish. So what are you supposed to do with it? So we had seen three opinions in the Mishnah. Rabbi Eliezer said you can bake the matzah first before. Um, it becomes chametz. Therefore, it'll never become chametz. You're allowed to bake it. Even though you're baking the challah, which you won't be able to eat, but it's not separated yet, you're baking it, you're allowed to bake it, and then uh, you don't have to worry about it becoming chametz. Rabbi Yeshua said no. Rabbi Yeshua said no, you don't have to worry about it at all. You can let it become chametz. It's not your chametz. You're not violating any iser. The third opinion, which, would, which we will discuss much later, uh, is Ben Pseiru just said, put it in cold water and it won't become chametz. You don't have to do anything about it. So now the Gemara has been discussing the concept of hoil, and the Gemara wants to match that up with this Machogas Rabbi Yeshua and Rabbi Eliezer. So the concept of hoil says as follows. It says that if you have the potentiality to do something, the fact that you could potentially do it gives you certain halachos based on that potentiality as well. We've been discussing it as far as cooking on Yom Tov. The is you're not allowed to cook on Yom Tov. You're only allowed to cook if you're planning on eating it. So if it's after your suit on Yom Tov and you're not going to eat whatever you're cooking now, you're really cooking it for during the week, you shouldn't be allowed to cook. The concept of whole would say, since maybe guests will come, and those guests will need food, and now you'll end up using the food that you're cooking now. Therefore, potentially, it could end up being used for eating on Yom Tov. Therefore, that potentiality gives it a status of being permitted, even though you're probably not going to end up using it. Again, in some, the potentiality that it may be used with guests, you're not going to eat it because you're full. But the, poten- the potentiality that guests may come and you'll end up using this food on Yom Tov makes it permitted for you to cook it now, uh, even though you have not invited any guests, you're not expecting any guests. That's the concept of whole. That's the machukas between Rav Chizda and Rabba. Um, as to whether we hold of that concept or not. Now, the Gemara wants to apply it to this machlokas between Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yeshua as to what you do with matzah that you're baking on Pesach, what you do with the challah that's in it. According to Rabbi Yeshua, you bake it so you avoid it becoming matzah, even though you're baking the challah. Uh, as, uh, according to Rabbi Eliezer, I'm sorry, you bake it uh, even though you're baking something which you're never going to use. So the Gemara wants to say he obviously holds of hoel. He says that, you know what? You're baking all this matzah. You haven't taken the challah yet. What, some of this challah is going to end up, some of this matzah is going to end up being separated as challah. But since each matzah that you're baking could potentially not become challah, it could potentially be the part that you eat and you're separating something else, that potentiality makes it permitted for you to bake this matzah now. And therefore, you're allowed to bake all the matzahs. According to Rabbi Yeshua, you can't bake it. Rabbi Yeshua says you're not allowed to bake it. You have to just leave it over. Rabbi Yeshua says you don't have to worry about it becoming chametz. But Rabbi Yeshua says you can't bake it because you'll be baking on Yom Tov something you're not going to eat. It's forbidden to eat. So Rabbi Yeshua doesn't hold of hoel. Rabbi Yeshua says the potentiality that each particular matzah will not be will will not be the challah that you're separating that does not make it permitted to bake them all. You're going to be baking one of them. You will be baking the one that will become challah eventually. Now. There's a separate issue here, and that is, 
are we concerned that it will become yours and it, it'll be chametz? Rabbi Elazar says you don't that it'll be a problem if it's chametz because it's considered yours because you could there is a concept of hoel there that you could um, take off the designation of chala and therefore it is considered yours. And Rabbi Shua says you don't say hoel there, but that's a different topic. That's a machlokus about whether it is a problem of it becoming chametz or not. That we've discussed on Daf Mavav. Here we are discussing whether or not you are allowed to bake it on Yom Tov. So Gemara wants to say it depends on Hoel. So Gemara rejects this. Gemara says it does not depend on Hoel. Hoel, that's a Malchus between Rabban and Avchiz, is a different type of Hoel. Rabban and Avchiz's Hoel is that guests may come and it'll be fitting for the guests. Here, it's different both Lakula and Lachoma, and therefore Rabbi Eliezer could agree that here there is no Hoel. Meaning, Rabbi Eliezer could say that I hold of Hoel in my case, and therefore you will be allowed to bake this matzah, but I would not agree with Rabba that there's Hoel, and therefore you'll have to cook for the guests, and the reason for that is obvious. This matzah you're going to use yourself. That you're cooking because guests may come. Guests may come, that's not a real potentiality. You didn't invite any guests, you're not expecting any guests. That somebody else may show up, that doesn't count as Hoel, has to be Hoel for you. And therefore, the fact that he says here that you're allowed to bake the matzah doesn't necessarily mean that he would say you're allowed to cook on Yom Tov after the Suda. Now, Rabbi Yeshua could say the other way. Rabbi Yeshua here doesn't hold the hole. He says you're not allowed to bake the matzah. That could be because none. there is a piece of challah here which is nobody's going to be able to eat. There is no potential. You're saying maybe each matzah that I bake, maybe this won't be the challah. Yeah, but if you're baking them all together, you're baking the one which will be challah, and there is no potentiality that that'll be permitted. Nobody's ever going to be able to use that because it's usher to eat. In the case of Rabban of Chiz, I would agree there. You could say hollow because all the food is, is permitted. Somebody's could be, somebody will eat each piece of it. But here, some of it is definitely not going to be eaten, and therefore I would not say hollow at all. That is the difference. Now the Gemara says that this link, this explanation, between Rabbi Yeshua and Rabbi Eliezer's Machlokis, this link to Rabbi and Chizda's Machlokis was said over um, in front of Rabbi Zeir and Rabbi Yirmiya. Uh, Rabbi Yirmiya liked it, he accepted it, Rabbi Zeir rejected it. So the Messiah Rabbi Yirmiya said, we've been walking around for years trying to figure out how does Rabbi Yeshua allow you to bake it? You shouldn't be allowed to bake bread uh, matzah, which is going to become usser. You should be no heter to do the malacha of baking on Yom Tov. We've been, for years we've been trying to figure that out. We finally have an explanation and you're going to reject it? So Rabbi Zayar said, well, I have to reject it. And I'll tell you why. Because we have a b'risa that relates the conversation b- between Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yeshua on the topic. And Rabbi Yeshua said to Rabbi Eliezer, according to you, you're allowed to bake it. How are you allowed to bake it? You're violating the malacha of baking. And you're not going to eat it. So there's no heter, there's no ochel nefesh. And Rabbi Eliezer didn't answer. So you see clearly that he doesn't have a reason. If you're telling me that you have a reason, so you, that doesn't fit in this b'risa where he didn't answer him. So Gemara says, Rabbi Yirmiya said back to Rabbi Zeira, what do you mean? According to what you, look at the second half of that b'risa, where Rabbi Eliezer says it's Taina Rabbi Yeshua, and he doesn't answer. He says, according to you, you're going to be walking around with an Isser Chametz. You're going to let this Chala become Chametz. You're going to be violating um, the Isser of Bayura Bayimatse. And Rabbi Yehoshua didn't respond. According to you, if he didn't respond, it means he doesn't have an answer. But in our Mishnah, on Daf Mem Vav, he does answer. He says it doesn't belong to you. Chala doesn't belong to you. You can't keep it, and you can't give it to a Kohen, so it doesn't belong to anyone. So just like he had an answer, but he didn't respond in that price, so, so in the first half, Rabbi Eliezer had an answer, and that's what we just learned here, that you say, Ho will. And uh, the fact that he didn't respond there is not a problem. He responded somewhere else in a different price, he gave his answer. Okay, now the Gemara discusses who is the halacha like. What do you do lemaisa when you are baking matzah on Pesach and you have to take off chal? So Gemara says, what's the psak? We see three opinions in the brayso. So Gemara says, Rabbi says the halacha is like Rabbi Eliezer. You should bake it all before you take off chal, and that way the chal that you take off will never become chametz. Maybe Yitzchak said the halacha is like Ben Pseira. You should put the chal that you take off into cold water, and then it won't become chametz until after Pesach, or at least after Yom Tov, when you're allowed to burn it. Okay, now the Gemara discusses what is the halacha, what is the maximum amount of dough you should be making at once on Pesach so that it shouldn't become chametz. If you have too much dough, it's harder to keep it from becoming chametz. What's the most you should make in one chat? 
So Yishmael Ben Eishem Yechem Ebreka says, depends if it's wheat or barley. If it's wheat, then you should do two kaven. Barley, you should do three kaven because wheat becomes chametz faster, so you should use a smaller amount of dough. Rabbi Nassim says it's the opposite. Uh, wheat becomes chametz slower, and therefore that's three kaven, and barley should be two kaven. And we have another b'risa where Rabbi Shmuel Ben Eishem Yechem Ebreka also says that wheat goes faster, but instead of being two kaven for wheat and three kaven for barley, it's three kaven for wheat and four kaven for barley. So it's two, three in one brisa and three, four in the other brisa. So it's a contradiction. The brisa is not a kasha. The lower amount is where it's um, low, is where it's high quality wheat or high quality barley, and therefore it will become chametz faster. Where it's low quality, then you can make larger amounts. The Gemara says this shows you that the difference in quality between uh, low quality wheat and good quality wheat is more than the difference in quality between low quality barley and good quality barley. How do you see that? Because in wheat, the low quality is too common and the 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 high quality is two kaven, and the low quality is three kaven, which means that there's a difference of one third. It's one. It's thirty three percent slower to become chametz, and you can have a thirty three percent larger batch. However, in barley, it's three and four, which is twenty five percent. So you see that it's twenty five percent lower quality. So the difference is greater in wheat than it is in barley. Now, the Gemara quotes Rav, who says that the maximum you should make is a kav of lugno, a lugnian kav. And then Rav says the same size is actually relevant for another halacha, and that is what is the minimum size flour that you need to be using in order to be chayev and taking off challah. It's also a kav lugno. So now the Gemara gets into the shir challah. The Gemara says that this is not correct. It actually should be four-fifths of a Tsipurian loig. That's what your Chayv and Chala. So Gemara says, yeah, when he, what he meant to say was that you use the Lugnoyan Kav when you measure. Um, okay. Now, the Gemara refers back to the discussion of how much you should make, how much dough you should make at once. Or Yosef says that women now have the minig to bake a kafiza at a time. Kafiza is three loigen, that's how much you should bake at a time. You should not bake uh, more than that. So the Gemara says, Abayi said to Rav Yosef, what do you think, that that's a chumrah? You're being machmir to use a very small amount, but that's chumrah is not just a chumrah, that is also a kula, because what ends up happening is that now you're not chayv and chala, you're not going to take off a chala, so you're being lenient. You think you're being strict, you're being lenient, you're being strict in helchas chametz, you're being lenient in helchas chala. The says, no, well, what we're planning to do is to take all the challahs afterwards, which is matzahs, hopefully, on Pesach. We plan to take all the matzahs after they're baked and put them in a big basket. And we hold like Rabbi Yezer, who says, if you put them all in a basket, they all combine together and add up to the sheer challah, then you have to take off challah. So Mark quotes the Bryce on that, and is what combines different doughs together to make a shir challah. According to Rabbi Eliezer, if it's you put them all in a basket. According to Rabbi Shua, it's what's in the oven together. You bake them in an oven together, they combine. According to Rabbi Shua and Ben Gamliel, it's if they touch each other. So if after, as they're growing in the oven, they expand and they touch each other, then they combine. So now the Gemara says, Rabbi Yehuda says in the name of Shmuel, Allah is like Rabbi Eliezer, uh, that it's Combines in the baskets. Gemara says, but we said on that, and Rishub and Levi said, but that's only if they're round challahs which touch in the oven. But if they're long, thin uh, strips, then they don't combine to the sheer challah. Gemara says, no, but we we don't agree with that because Rabbi Chanina says even if they're strips, they still combine. Now Gemara says, Rabbi Yirmiya says, as far as what you use as a basket, what if you just use a board that has no lips? Does that count as a basket to combine? Uh, it says, take it, we're not sure if that combines them, it could be you actually have a basket with a rim, that's what you need. Okay, this takes us to the end of uh, this Gemara, now we start the next Mishnah, which discusses what happens when multiple people want to use one oven. The ovens were small, it could not fit everybody's matzahs to bake all at once, and they had to take turns. So, how do you organize it that they are taking turns? The problem is, is while you're waiting for somebody else to finish in the oven, your dough is sitting around. When dough sits around, it becomes chametz. So, how do you handle that situation? So, there are three approaches here. Rabban Gamliel says they could all knead the dough, make the matzahs at the same time, and they'll wait. 
It's not a problem in the time that it takes to wait for somebody for the other two. He says up to three women at once can each need their dough. And the time that it takes to wait for two people to finish before you, the third woman's dough is not going to become chametz. You don't need to worry about it. Says the Gemara, the Chachamim say, no, you shouldn't do it like that. There should be a rotation. The Gemara explains there are three steps to the process. There is working the flour and water mixture into a d- d- dough. Then there is forming the shapes. And then there is the actual baking in the oven. So while the first woman is kneading her dough, the other two women shouldn't be doing anything. When she moves on to the shaping, then the second woman should start mixing her flour and water. And when the first woman moves on to the baking, the second woman moves on to the shaping, and the third woman could then start mixing her flour and water. And then as they move along from stage to stage, the third woman, when her baking finishes, could start again with mixing the dough. And this way you have a rotation, three women, three steps, and uh, everybody will get the chance to put their dough into the oven, without having to wait, because it will become available as soon as they finish their process, the step before the actual baking itself. Now the Gemara, uh, the Mishnah says that Rabbi Akiva, he disagreed, and he said you can't make general rules. Women work at different speeds, branches burn at different heats, and ovens bake at different speeds. So you can't make a rule like this. So therefore he says what you should just do is that the woman should keep her eye on her dough, and if she sees it starts to become chametz, she should put it into cold water, it'll stop the chametz process. The Gemara quotes a b'risa where Rabbi Kiva says that I said this over to Rabban Kamliel, and he agreed with me. I said to him, when you're saying that three women can work together, and up to uh, three, because the third woman could wait her turn, and her dough won't become chametz, so I asked him, what type of women are you talking about? Women who work slower, or women who work fast? What type of wood are you talking about? Dry wood or damp wood? What what type of oven are you talking about? A hot oven or a cold oven? So he said, he agreed with me, and he said, no, just put it in cold water. If you see it starts to become chametz, wait your turn. When I say wait your turn, I'm saying wait your turn. And if it starts to become chametz, put it into cold water, and you'll arrest the chimot process. Okay, now we're up to our next Mishnah, and this Mishnah is discussing how can you tell when a dough is becoming chametz? What is the chametz process? So there are three levels of chametz. There's not chametz at all. That's one level. On the opposite ex- extreme, there's where it's already chametz and you're chayev karis if you eat it. You got to burn it chayev karis. In between, there's the middle level, which is called siur, where it starts becoming chametz, but it's not chametz yet. That you do have to destroy. You have to burn it. But if you eat it, you're not chayev karis. That's not karis. It's perhaps a love, but it's not karis. How do you identify these three levels? So the Mishnah quotes a Rabbi Yehuda and a Chachamim. And Rabbi Yehuda says, when cracks start to appear, but they still remain separate from each other, that is the middle level. When the cracks start to interweave with each other, they cross, they crisscross each other, that is when it is officially chametz. The Chachamim disagree and they say both of those are officially chametz. The stage, which is called middle level, that's where it turns a pale color, like somebody who got a fright and he turned white. That is when the dough is in the middle level. That's just before the chimutz begins. Now, the Gemara quotes Brisa. The Brisa spells out that the other opinion that argues on Rabbi Huda is Rabbi Meir. So Rabbi Meir is the one who says that the middle level is where it turns pale. And Rabbi Huda says, no, that's when it, when cracks appear. And Rabbi Meir says, when cracks appear on top, even though they're not combined on top, they are combined deeper into the dough, and therefore that's considered to be real chametz. That's third level chametz, and that's what you're trying to first. Drive the Daf is a project of the Grand Woodland School and is presented by Rabbi Yitzchak Landa. Find us on YouTube or subscribe to daily emails by emailing drivethedaf at gmail.com.